It is good to be back. Although I've only been away one Sunday, for some reason it feels like it's been a month. I took my week's vacation week before last and then came back from that to go on the mission trip this past week with the youth. But I want you to know something. Everything we do as a church is about what they just sang, but even more so last week and next week. This past week, the youth and I spent a week at Myrtle Beach. And everybody goes, oh boy, that's a real mission trip there. But let me tell you what's going on at Myrtle Beach. There's a theater there that's right on basically the, the main strip where the Ripley's Aquarium and all that stuff, kind of the main gathering if you've been to Myrtle Beach lately where the zip line and all that is. That was built in 1958, but it had been closed, I think, since the mid-80s. And it's set there vacant and dormant. And through Scott and his leadership, when they, God moved him to Myrtle Beach several years ago, they began to look for a place or a venue in a way that they could share Christ in this setting with Myrtle Beach. Because whether you realize it or not, folks, the world comes to Myrtle Beach. The world. People from other countries come to Myrtle Beach. But as far as I know, in all my history and my years down there, and I realized when I was there, I think it had been about 25 years since I'd been, at least on the strip part, that there's never been anything Christian, sanctified, set apart in all that stuff that goes on. Now, they've been doing that beach blast thing, I think, about five years now, and from what I understand, they pack the place out, and it's an evening of Christian music and bands and youth ministries from all over the various states that come and participate, but nothing constant, nothing steady. They've taken this movie theater in the city knowing, again, just an act of God and how he has worked and moved through all this, basically leased them the building for a dollar a year under the condition that they, in turn, refurbish and restore the building. And you ought to see it. You ought to see this building. They just don't build stuff like they did then. The architecture, the brickwork, and it just phenomenal, and especially the amount of work that's gone on in it. Be proud of your youth. And the work that they did this past week, and I know to some of them it may not have seemed very significant, we did a lot of cleaning, a lot. They'll tell you about that next week. There wasn't a day, I think, that didn't pass that somebody, if not half the group, had a shop vac in their hand. And for an 18,000 square foot building, I think we vacuumed it through at least three different times. But construction is a messy thing, but every step, is just as important as the next, and they're about this close to finishing. And when they get done, there's going to be a constant venue of Jesus Christ on the main strip of Myrtle Beach that I believe God is going to use to reach the world, especially through teenagers. That's their whole target. That's their whole focus. Teenagers. Reaching teenagers for Christ. Do want to thank Randy for filling in for me last week. I understand he did a fantastic job, which I knew that he would. Had no doubt about that. And so we're going to dive back into where we actually left off a few weeks ago. If you would take your Bibles and stand with me this morning. Loud and strong. This is my Bible. The light into my path. I believe it is the indestructible, inexhaustible, infallible Word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. My mind is alert. My ears are open. And my heart is receptive to receive God's Word. Today I will be forever changed. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. If you haven't already, turn with me in that Bible to... The eighth chapter of Luke, and we're not doing a systematic study, even though we've been in Luke for several weeks now, barring last week, but that's just where God's had me lately, and so until he leads me to another place, we're going to continue on. Beginning in verse 40, and as Jesus returned, the people welcomed him, for they had all been waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, and he was an official of the synagogue. And he fell at Jesus' feet and began to implore him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. But as he went, the crowds were pressing against him. 
And a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, who is the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone did touch me. For I was aware that power had gone out from me. When the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before him and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But when Jesus heard this, he answered him, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe, and she will be made well. When he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter except with him except Peter and John and James and the girl's father and mother. Now they were all weeping and lamenting for her. But he said, Stop weeping, for she has not died but is asleep. And they began laughing at him, knowing that she had died. He, however, took her by the hand and called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up immediately, and he gave orders for something to be given her to eat. Her parents were amazed, but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. Father, as we look into your word today, Lord, we're going to look at a man and a woman's life who though they were on different spectrums of life. On this particular day, they shared something very life-changing in common. They were both desperate. They were both in dire need. And Lord, I believe that there is many here today, if not every one of us, that are also in some kind of need. Lord, it may not be as severe a situation as either one of these, but I pray that you would help us to see today that you are the master of everything in life. And you are the one through whom deliverance comes. No matter what our circumstance or our obstacle may be, you are bigger, you are larger, if we will simply allow you to be Lord of every area of our life. Father, we do lift to you today, especially the nation of Israel. I pray, Lord, for your peace and protection there. In the midst of this turmoil that's going on, Father, we pray for your people and their safety. We just ask, Lord, that you would somehow work in and through this conflict, Lord, and that you might bring about a peaceful resolution. But we pray that, Lord, also knowingly that you have told us in your word there will be no peace until Christ returns. So, Father, until that time, we pray your will be done. We pray your blessings upon Jerusalem, your protection of your people, and, Father, the victory for this battle in which they endure. We ask you these in all things in Christ's holy name. Amen. If you were here a few weeks ago, you recall that where we left off here in the 8th chapter of Luke, Jesus had basically healed or set free this man that was possessed by demons, the demonic as he's often referred to, that he was so wild and so out of control that even when they would chain him up, he would break the chains and he basically was living out in the tombs, uh, wouldn't even wear clothes. He was just basically a wild man who was completely and totally out of his mind. And if you were here, you also recall that Jesus healed him, and he set him free. And when all the people came out from the city, they found this man that they all knew who he was, sitting here, clothed, and in his right mind. And we also read that the people began imploring Jesus, because after he cast out the demons, we saw where the demons asked permission. They went into a, a herd of swine or pigs, which in turn ran down the side of a hill into the lake and drowned and died. But when all the people heard everything that had gone on, basically as soon as they get there, the first thing they do is ask Jesus to leave. Will you get out of here? Be it their superstitions, fear, whatever it was, they wanted him gone. And so imagine the scene and basically pick up where we left off. Jesus did exactly what they asked. God will never go where he's not wanted. He will never intrude where he's not welcomed. If you don't want him there, don't worry. You've just settled the issue. He won't be there. But they ask him to leave. So imagine the scene. We've got a crowd of people standing on the shore kind of shaking their head as he's going out of sight. Whew. Thank you. He's gone. Finally. Get, get, they don't even wave. They just 
look, except one man, he's waving. He's waving because his life will never be the same. He's he's waving because he's been set free. He's waving because his mind has been restored and he's now got a story to tell that many people ain't even going to believe. And he's waving his heart out because the truth is he wanted to be in the boat with them and they left. But now as the boat's crossing this lake, almost as you begin to get a view of what's coming, here's the... the, um, Galileans on the other side of the lake. Hurry up, guys. Row faster. Get him in here. We've been waiting on Jesus. Don't know where y'all been, what you've been doing, but we just want to see him. The Gerasenes couldn't wait for him to leave. The Galileans couldn't hardly wait for him to arrive. And in verse 40, the readers informed that as Jesus and his disciples to return here to the beaches of Capernaum, it says that they are welcomed him warmly. They'd been waiting for him. What we have before us this morning is two interwoven stories that I believe will teach us some fascinating principles on faith. And the first one I want you to see is in verses 41 through 43. And there came a man named Jairus, and he was an official of the synagogue, and he fell at Jesus' feet and began to implore him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter about 12 years old, and she was dying. But as he went, the crowds were pressing against him. The first thing I want us to see this morning is this. Faith is almost always born out of need. Faith is almost always born out of need. In order for you to have experienced salvation, you knew you needed to be saved. No matter what it is, what the circumstance, what the obstacle, whatever life is throwing at us, faith is almost always born out of need. Jairus was the head of a local synagogue. Keep in mind the religious leaders of the day weren't accepting Jesus. He's one of those leaders. He's one of the synagogue leaders. But in this hour of extreme need, he not only comes to Jesus publicly, he comes and falls on his face, on his knees before Jesus publicly. The text says that he reverently made his request. He fell at his feet. And he passionately made his case. He begged him. Please. Please come to my house. He cast aside his pride. This religious leader fell on his face. Desperate for one last lifeline. For his little girl. My daughter's 11 years old. I can't even imagine. Some of you may have been there before. Some of you may have been there with your own child when you've been told this kind of news. If so, you know exactly how this man feels. Here was a man that had power, prestige, public recognition, seemed like everything in life was going for him, but he is completely and totally helpless to do anything for his little girl. And you can rest assured that every doctor that was available around had already been to see her. Being a synagogue ruler, you know, he was a pastor of the day. Everybody did all these things for the pastor. So you can guarantee every doctor that was anywhere in the vicinity had already been there. And notice something else. He comes and begs. Jesus heads out with him without saying a word. He just goes. And on the way to help this man, he meets another. Verse 43. And a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone. She's got a flow of blood for 12 years. She spent, when we read the account in Mark chapter 5, all her livelihood, all her wealth that she had had been spent on physicians. And none of them have been able to do anything. We are told that this woman had a flow of blood and abnormal bleeding from the wound. In Mark's account, it is twice called a plague. And that word translated plague is a word that actually is a connotation of the word whip like to whip, to to drive something out. And notice the things that this whip drove from her life. The first thing it drove from her life was her strength and health. For 12 years, she had grown steadily weaker and weaker. Secondly, it drove her from her husband and her family. There's no mention of a husband, but if she had one, in a day when marriage was as easy as getting out of divorce, the only thing, do you know the only thing that a woman had to do back then for a man to divorce her? Burn his toast in the morning. If she did something as silly as burn his toast, 
he could publicly write her out a statement that says, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And it was a done deal. They didn't have to go to the judge. They didn't have to see a lawyer. They didn't have to. It was over. He probably dumped her years ago. The fact is she could not touch or be touched by anyone because of this condition. Thirdly, it drove her from her friends. She was ostracized from society. Three things in daily Jewish life could make a person ceremonially unclean. Death, the a touching of a dead body, menstrual bleeding, and leprosy. Any one of these three, if you had anything to do with, you couldn't touch anyone or anything. Finally, it drove her from her place of worship. She'd been excluded from church for 12 years. She couldn't even go to church on Sunday. In verse 43, Dr. Luke says that she was humanly incurable. And now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and couldn't be healed by any, in spite of all her previous effort, she remained unhealed. She still suffered pain. All the different treatments she had succeed or tried had only succeeded in making her poor. The verse says she spent all her livelihood on physicians. She'd gone to many all doctors, and the only thing the doctors had cured her of was her bank account. Individual after individual had raised her hopes, only to dash them to the ground when they failed to help her. Mark 5 also tells us she suffered many things from many physicians, searching for an accurate diagnosis. 12 years. Can you imagine? Without a remedy for a problem. And presumably by now she's decided there, there is no hope for my problem. In fact, she was worse off and better. This poor woman was broke, cut off from family, society, and could not have felt any lower. I'm sure she had to deal with some bitterness. There was probably some anger inside. Who knows? She may have been angry at God. Why? Why would you let me suffer like this for 12 years? Why can't I be cured? Why is there no help? Loneliness, fear of the future, alienation for God. Now, I want you to notice something here that these two share in common, yet were completely and totally different. How old was Jairus' daughter? 12 years. How long had this woman been suffering? 12 years. They lived right here in the same vicinity, very likely in walking distance from each other. For the last 12 years, Jairus' life had probably been great and getting greater every year. His daughter was getting older. He loved her and cherished her. He was a leader in the local church. Everything good was happening. Everything great was going on. And every one of those 12 years, this other woman's life was getting worse and worse year by year. But on this particular day, in this place we call desperation, there's a lot of common ground. You discover a lot of that common ground at the hospital. If you're up there with somebody sick and you meet another family that's got somebody in the same con kind of conditions, at that point it don't matter who you are, what your name is, how much money you got, where you live, or nothing else. You're both hanging on to the hopes of what they can hopefully do inside that medical facility. That's where these two were today. Totally different spectrums of life. She had lost everything. Jarius had everything. But he was on the verge of losing it all. Because I'm sure even with his successful life, if he would have lost that daughter, many people who have gone through that says it feels like a part of them dies. And I guess in some reality it does. Faith is always born out of need. Second, faith always demands a response. Look at verse 44. Came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Mark tells us again in his account in chapter 5 that when she heard about Jesus, and in the Greek the definite article is before the name Jesus. Jesus was a very common name in Palestine in those days. She heard about not just Jesus, the Jesus. And when she heard, she made a decision. At this, which was probably the lowest point of her life, this woman hears about this Jesus and decides that he is different. He's different from all the other Jesus that she may have heard about before. He's different from all those who have succeeded only in robbing her of her money and more importantly of her hope. 
The Bible says that faith comes by hearing. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. True faith demands a response. It's never enough for us just to hear the word. We must also believe and do it. If you leave out of here on a Wednesday night or a Sunday school and say, man, that was a great lesson. That was just awesome. We had great discussion, whatever it may have been. But you walk out of here and it has no effect on the way you live your life. That's not faith. It's just knowledge. Faith demands a reaction. And usually it demands that we do something differently than what we have been. It's not enough to hear the word. Listen, she not only heard about Jesus, she believed what she heard. She had decided in her mind that if she could just get near him and touch him, she'd be healed. Matthew 9, 21 says, For she said to herself, If only I may touch the hem of his garment, I shall be well. Literally what it's saying is she kept on saying, If I can just touch him, if I can just get near him and touch him, I know if I can get near him and touch him, I, I know that's all I need to do, get near him and touch him. She kept saying it. She kept believing it. And she acted on it. Now, in order for her to act, her faith had to overcome some obstacles. She could have allowed those hindrances to easily become excuses. It's so prevalent in our day-to-day, -day, I can't hardly stand it sometimes. The first obstacle that she had to overcome was her physical weakness. It must have been difficult for this woman even to get out of bed, let alone to fight her way through a crowd. Last year on my sabbatical after I returned from Israel, a few weeks later I went up and went to a three-day retreat at the Cove. And I remember what the topic was, and by the time I arrived there, things had changed so much in what God was doing in me, I almost felt like, man, this topic don't even apply anymore. I wonder if I should even be coming. And what was amazing was Steve Brown, who was leading the conference, from the time he got up there that night, you know the first thing he said? I know that this thing is titled so-and-so, and this is the title of the conference and what it's going to be, but forget all that because I'm going in a totally different direction. And I said, wow. But at the end of that thing on Sunday, he allowed people to share testimonies of what God had spoken and revealed to them. And I heard a woman whose condition was about like Rebecca's. For those of you who don't know Kevin, Rebecca's wife, she's got rheumatoid arthritis, which has thrown her limbs, her legs, and everything in. And this woman in tears was sharing about how when she kept hearing this conference advertised, her heart kept saying, go, go, go. And her mind and her body kept saying, no, no, no. And as she talked about the struggle that it was for her just to get up and get out of bed and get ready every day, I wish you could have heard her testimony and said, you don't know how blessed I am because I want y'all to know in here this day that God has healed me this weekend. She said, my arms don't move any more than they did when I got here, nor my legs. But God has healed me this weekend because he's healed my heart. And who knows, he may decide to heal my arms and legs too. She went from a hopeless heart almost when upon arrival, and she left there with a hope-filled heart. But she had to overcome the obstacle. She had to drag herself literally out of bed and make herself go and not make an excuse any longer. The second obstacle that she had to face was her own hopelessness and despair. The third obstacle that she had to overcome was the press of the crowd around Jesus. She had to force her way basically through a crushing mob, but in a way as to not draw attention to herself because she wasn't supposed to touch anybody. She was a woman. She was a woman with a problem that rendered her unclean. She was a woman with a female problem that she most certainly, I'm sure, didn't want to declare or proclaim before a large crowd. And the final obstacle she had to co overcome was the social and religious stigma that she dare not touch somebody like Jesus because the instant she did, he would become unclean. But she did overcome the obstacle. She finally got within reach of Jesus. By the way, what's blocking you from reaching out to him this morning? What's blocking you? Maybe it's not a crowd of people. Maybe it's finances. 
Maybe it's your pride. Maybe it's shame. What is it that's keeping you from reaching out to Jesus? And I'm not saying that you don't have some real obstacles. Chances are you do. We all do at various times. But what I am asking is, what's keeping you from reaching out? Because sometimes ours may be physical. His was physical, the life and health of his daughter. Hers was physical. Sometimes there may be mental. But we've got to quit making excuses and be willing to act. Jesus is the master of healing. Jesus is the master of life, as we're going to see in this account this morning. But remember two weeks ago? He's also the master of our mind. Because we came upon a man that was demon-possessed, and basically the Bible says had lost his mind. But when Jesus left, his mind was restored. It tells us clearly he was back in his right mind. So he's not only the master of health, he's not only the master of life, he's the master of our mind. Anybody can't get your mind under control lately? You can't wonder why you keep thinking depressing thoughts, bad thoughts, revengeful thoughts, angry thoughts. No matter how hard you try, and sometimes it seems like it gets worse instead of better. We're told in verse 44, look at it again, came up behind him. And touched the fringe of his cloak. The woman came to Jesus secretly from behind. Because she felt unworthy to approach him directly. I believe Satan often reminds us that just how dirty we are. So we like her will be too ashamed to come. Man, I can't come to God. Look at all this stuff I've been doing. I'm supposed to be a Christian and I've done this and I've lied about that. And I've blew my temper over here and. I can't come near God. He's too clean. He's too pure. He's too holy. I'm sure she felt that way too. So she comes up behind him, trying to remain unnoticed. Upon touching him, she was instantly healed. We don't know how, but we know she knew it at the moment she touched him. No doubt she intended to remain as inconspicuous as possible. Let the crowd pass on, leave her alone, and go back to her house and hopefully a normal life. With a touch of faith, she draws power out of Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. How many hands do you think touched him that day? A bunch. But only one drew power from him. I bet you there were hands all over him. You ever seen how crazy people get at concerts and all that stuff? They'll be tearing people's clothes off and stuff. There were hands reaching, trying to get on his head, his shoulder, anywhere they could get. Just let me touch. And out of all those hands and all those touches, only one, it says, that power went out from him. In one touch. She received healing. All the rest of them weren't receiving anything. We should fear only one thing this morning. That we let him pass by without responding in faith. To reach out whatever it is he's offering us. Our faith is born out of need. Faith demands a response. Faith cannot remain anonymous. Look at verses 45 through 47. And Jesus said, who is the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone did touch me, for I was aware that power had gone out of me. When the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before him and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. Faith cannot remain anonymous. Is it really possible that Jesus didn't know who touched him? Of course not. He knew exactly who had touched him. He knew what had happened and who had touched him. He asked the question to bring the woman out of hiding. Now initially notice that nobody admitted they touched him. But Jesus wouldn't let it drop. In verse 46, Jesus said, somebody touched me. Don't tell me they didn't. I know they did. The word genesco, 
used here literally means knows. She knew it, and she knew he knew it. Peter replies to Jesus with something like this. Lord, you've you got to be kidding me. Look at this mob. How can we possibly know who touched you? In my imagination, I can almost see Peter as he rolls his eyes. Lord, it'd probably be easier if you said, who didn't touch you? It seems an impossible question, but perhaps more importantly, it seemed to be a pointless question. What difference does it make? And not let's forget something here. Let's not forget something else and someone else. Remember where Jesus is going? To Jairus' house. His 12-year-old girl's about to die. And now he's going to take time out to go, okay, who touched me? I know it was somebody here. Who touched me? Can you imagine what Jairus is thinking? He's probably exasperated by, beyond words. Precious times being lost. His little daughter's slipping away by the minute. He must have been thinking, come on, Jesus, my daughter's dying. Who cared who touched you? As Jesus dealt with a problem that in Jairus' eyes was not an emergency, I'm sure he had to question Jesus' timing. And in the same way, you and I often, often struggle to understand God's timing. Ultimately, we have to learn that faith means trusting in God's care, and it also means accepting God's timing. In Mark 5.32, we're told that Jesus looked around to see the woman who had done this. It literally means that he was penetrating he turned around and started doing this. Who did it? Who touched me? He was looking into every one of them's eyes. He stops, turns around, scans the crowd. This woman's trying to hide, but he won't let her. Why? Why? Because he knows how much she needs him. Listen, she's already been healed. She's already experienced the touch of God's power in her body. He, she's already been healed. But she still needs him. Not just his healing power. And he knows it. This woman had not expected to be detected. But when Jesus turned around and asked the question, she knew that he knew. And if she had taken a great leap of faith before, which she had, I'm sure she's ready to take a great leap of escape about right now. Remember the penalty for deliberately making somebody unclean during that time was stoning. If you were leprous, had touched a dead body, or were in the menstrual period of, as a woman and touched somebody else and made them unclean, you could be stoned. Perhaps she thought she'd done wrong in touching him. Look at verse 47 again. When the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before him and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. She told it all. She didn't care any longer. What had been a 12-year embarrassing thing that she may have hardly ever even told anyone, now she tells everyone. You know why she was able to do that? Because when the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. And you're free to tell the truth, and you don't care who likes it and who don't. Because if you know Jesus has done it, it is what it is. Some people can like it, lump it, deal with it, get over it, whatever they have to do. But you just tell it like it is. She came forward trembling, fell at his feet, and confessed she was the one who had touched him. This woman had received a whole lot more than she expected, but much less than what Jesus desired to give her. Why did he insist on her public profession? It wasn't a miracle he wanted to make public but rather her faith. He demanded it for the benefit of others. Remember, all these people were reaching out and touching, but the power had only gone out to her. Faith is not intended to be a private matter as some people think it is. How often have you heard somebody decline to discuss their spiritual condition, justifying themselves with the statement, well, my faith is a personal thing. 
Faith in Christ is never intended to be personal. The reason God saved you is so that you will tell the world. And any time you have a discussion, family member, friend, or stranger, and begin to talk to them about their personal faith, if they get angry or offended or upset, it's a red flag indicator. There's a problem there. There's a problem. Because when Christ sets you free and you know that you know him and you know that you're his and you know where you're going when this life is over, you want everyone to know. It's not a secret. This was so important that Jesus refused to allow her to go without a confession of faith. Do you know he still requires that same confession today? Elsewhere, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, Whoever therefore shall confess me before men... Him I will confess also before my Father who is in heaven. Paul says it as well. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Faith cannot remain anonymous. And faith revealed is faith rewarded. Look at verse 48. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Jesus was incredibly gentle with this woman do you know this was the only woman he ever referred to as daughter jesus rewarded her confession by telling her go in peace and the literal meaning of this phrase is go into peace paul says in his letter to the romans in 5 1 therefore being justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ now i know you hadn't asked for my opinion this morning but i'm gonna give it to you anyway i believe this woman was healed physically in verse 44 and she was healed spiritually or saved by her confession in verse 47 she had been healed physically but this was only temporary i know a lot of people in my life right now that i believe have experienced the touch and healing power of god in their life but it's never led to salvation and unfortunately i think sometimes people mistake the two for one and they're not God can touch you and heal you or touch and heal somebody in your family if you lift them up in prayer and it's his will to do so. But even if he heals them from the deathbed itself, that's not salvation. That's the power of God at work in their life and in their body, but it's not salvation. Salvation is a confession that only each individual can make. Her body would break down again someday. Her body was eventually going to die someday. In faith, she touched the hem of his gown and was healed. Healed physically by this touch of faith, and I believe saved spiritually when she stepped forward in confession. Faith revealed is faith rewarded. And faith holds on when reason says give up. Let's look at the last several verses. While he was still speaking, someone came from the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But when Jesus heard this, he answered him, Do not be afraid any longer. Only believe, and she will be made well. When he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter with him except Peter and John and James and the girl's father and mother. Now they were all weeping and lamenting for her, but he said, Stop weeping, for she has not died but is asleep. And they began laughing at him, knowing that she had died. He, however, took her by the hand and called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned. And she got up immediately, and he gave orders for something to be given her to eat. Her parents were amazed, but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. Faith holds on when reason says give up. All the reason in the world would have told Jairus, It's too late now. He was coming. He was going to touch her. He was going to heal her. But it's too late now. She's died. She's taken her last breath. It's over. If he wouldn't have got delayed with this woman and so worried about who it was that touched him, maybe he'd have been there on time. Maybe he could have got there a few minutes early. Maybe he could have saved her. You'll also remember that the healing of this woman occurred as Jesus made his way to the home of Jairus, whose daughter is deathly ill. Our final principle of faith is seen in the life of Jairus. Previously, we read in verse 41 of his request for Jesus to come and how Jesus began his journey with Jairus to his home. 
And as we pick up the story in verse 49, we see that things have taken a decided turn for the worse. While Jesus was speaking to the woman about her healing, a servant comes along with the bad news and says, while he was still speaking, someone came to his house and said, hey, Jerry, man, I don't know how to tell you this, but she, she's gone. She's gone. Don't, don't bother the teacher anymore. There's nothing he can do now. The delay necessary for the healing woman, I'm sure in Jairus' mind, brought disastrous results. If he hadn't just stopped. So long as she was only at the point of death, there was hope, but not now. It's one thing to believe in a healing. It's quite another to believe in a resurrection. But it now appealed that the healing of this woman has cost the life of Jairus' daughter. What pain and disappointment, even anger, must have flooded his soul. But Jesus quickly reassures him in verse 50. Do not be afraid. Only believe and she'll be made well. He tells him not to be afraid. Only believe. It literally means start believing and don't stop believing. It's where fear is to be met by faith. Why would Jesus tell him don't be afraid? You know what Jairus had probably been doing the whole time that thing was going on with the woman? This, was, this is what I'd have been doing because that's my watch these days. A few minutes later. A few minutes later. Jesus says, listen, don't be afraid. Faith is not the belief that we'll get what we want. Faith is the belief that God knows what's best. In verse 51, we're told that Jesus asked only the mother and father and three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, to go into the room. Was he showing favoritism? I don't think so. I believe he asked those who knew would be open and affirming. The probing question for you and I today is this. If we'd have been one of his disciples, you think he would have asked you to go? Would you have been one of the three? Because he knew your heart was so open and you had that kind of faith. He rebuked the mourners in verse 52 by telling them not to weep. She's not dead but sleeping. These mourners were likely paid professionals. That's what they had in those days. If you didn't have enough family to cry and moan and wound, you could go out and actually hire people to come in that were professional mourners. And they'd come in and cry for your loss. We know that's what they must have been because notice basically they go from tears to laughter. As soon as Jesus tells them that she's not dead, they start laughing at him. But he cleared the room of all the skeptics. He put them outside. Now he turns his attention to the girl in the second part of verse 54. He took her by the hand saying, little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and the Bible says she rose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. Why did he do so? He raised her to life. In Mark's account, we're told that Jesus said, Talitha Thumai. It was an unforgettable moment, so much so for Peter, he remembers the very words of Jesus. Mark doesn't even put it in the Greek. He leaves it in the Aramaic. And the very words of Jesus basically said, little lamb, get up. The same phrase a mother might use to get her daughter up in the morning. Wake up, little darling. Get up, little princess. Until they get up. And but he raised her from the dead. The critics would say the girl was not really dead, but she was just really that she had lapsed into a coma. And about the time Jesus arrived, she was coming out of her. But remember the family who saw her all the time knew death? They knew she'd stopped breathing. They declared her dead. The mourners who ridiculed Jesus' statement, they knew what death looked like. They were paid to be around it. They knew death when they saw it. And the Lord knew she was physically dead because notice it says her spirit returned to her. It had been gone. Why did he do this? Was it for the little girl's sake? No. But for, was it for her parents' sake? Yeah. Did he do it so that we might expect the same thing today? No. In verse 56, Jesus tells the astonished parents, don't tell anyone what happened. 
Can you imagine the surprise on the faces of the mourners when that little girl come walking out of the room and said, somebody give me something to eat. This family must have been Baptist because the first thing in the order of business was from resurrection was for food. But think of the frustration of those onlookers when they said, tell us what happened. What did he do? What went on in there? And they said, I'm sorry. But Jesus told us very emphatically not to tell you. Now, it may be that you say, all this talk about faith is fine. It's wonderful how he healed the woman, and it's wonderful how he raised the little girl back to life. But he didn't do that for me. I'm still sick, and he hadn't healed me. Or my loved one died, and they are gone, and even though I wanted him to heal them or I want them back, why didn't he do that for me? Why doesn't he respond that way today? The answer is that he healed this woman, he raised his child, in order that you and I may have a new view of sickness and of death and of who he is. Dr. G. Campbell Morgan, that great preacher of the 19th century, spoke from his own experience when he said, I can hardly speak of this matter without becoming personal and reminiscent, remembering a time 40 years ago when my own first daughter lay at the point of death, dying. I called for him then, and he came. And he spoke to our troubled hearts, fear not, believe only. But he did not say she may be made well or she may be made whole. Not at least on this earthly path. He said she passed away into the life beyond. But he did say, Talitha Kumai, little lamb, arise. But in her case, that didn't mean on earth level. It meant that he needed her, and he took her to be with himself. She has been with him all these years as we measure time here, and I've missed her every day. But his word, believe only, has been the strength of all these passing years for me. And that's why today the Christian can stand beside the bed of a loved one who is ill and pray that God will heal them and believe that God can heal them. And if the loved one dies, they can still believe that God did heal them by bringing them into his eternal presence. This life is not all there is. And here's the other part I want you to know this morning before we go into our time of invitation. Jesus is still looking for hurting people, broken-hearted people, damaged, frustrated, hopeless people, people who cover up all their hurts, people who have been hurt by so many people so many times they don't trust anyone any longer. He's looking for people just like that, reaching out to people just like that. You may be that lady, and you've tried everything and everyone else you can possibly think of to heal the condition you may. If you will only reach out in faith to this master who controls all things, your life like hers can be changed in an instant, changed by a touch. And yes, Jesus can still bring dead things back to life. He can give us back things we may have believed that we've lost forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you, Lord, for who you are, that you are the master of life. You are the master of healing. You are the master of the mind. You are the master of everything in this world, Father, because your word says that everything was created through and by Jesus Christ himself. And so we ask, Lord, as we believe that you are here and passing through this morning, that if there is one here that is hurting, one here who's been dealing with a physical infirmity for years, maybe months, doesn't seem to be going away, doesn't seem to be getting better, someone who's dealing with a situation or circumstance who may not be anything like these two we've talked about, Today, they share everything in common with this boy because they, like them, stand at that place called desperation. Maybe they've tried everything and everyone else, all to no avail. And so, Lord, we ask you today, if it is needed, increase our faith. That we, like Jarius, would not worry about position or prestige or anything else, but fall on our face before Jesus.
and beg him to do what only he can do. Be like this woman. Even if we may feel ashamed or dirty. Even if we feel like we have to come up and sneak up behind him. But knowing if we can just touch him, then everything can be changed. Increase our faith, Father. That we may be the people you have called us to be. And that we may come to Christ with every circumstance, every obstacle, and everything we face. Ask these and all things in His holy name. Would you stand with me?